welcome, welcome. Um, so uh, for those of you who do not know me, um, my name is Kyle Byrne, and I'm the Assistant Director of Student and Alumni Engagement here in the Lapenta School of Business. And uh, this is a view from the C-suite. So this is where we invite us. Um, so I'm excited to welcome here tonight Zine Mazuzi. Uh, let's give him a round of applause for, for coming here. Um, he is the uh, Chief Financial Officer of Steve Madden, which is a brand that many of us here in the room tonight uh, are And so tonight we're going to learn more about uh, Zine's story, right? Um, you know, his story of achieving the American dream, um, being an international student from Morocco, coming here with, you know, limited English, um, to becoming CFO of not one, but four different billion dollar brands, um, including Nine West, Sears, Kmart, and now Steve Madden. Um, he's a double graduate of Iona um, in the Lapenta School of Business, having received a, a BBA in finance and international business, and he also has an MBA in finance, and he's a member of our Lapenta School of Business Executive Advisory Council. Um, so I thought we'd start off just tonight, you know, talking about, you know, your Iona story, um, then moving into your career journey. Um, and then finish with some advice for the students, as many of them, you know, um, are thinking about life after Iona and who may actually aspire to be a C-suite executive um, uh, one day. So, and then at the end, we'll leave some time for Q&A, um, you know, for the audience. And uh, yeah, so thank you for being here tonight, Zine. Pleasure. So I just want to start off, you know, going, you know, what brought you to Iona? So you're originally from Morocco, right? Yes. Um, and you know, you know, your family wanted you to pursue a, a degree in medicine, right? Yes. And so you started that studying at a school, and classes were in French. Mm -hmm. All right. You then didn't like it, or you switched over to management. Uh, no, my dad didn't like it. Okay, <laughs> your dad didn't like it, so you yeah. um, switched to management. All right, and then um, you ended up transferring to Iona, right, with limited English. Um, so talk about you know what brought you to Iona and the United States. Um, you shared with me that your family gave one of their children the option to study in the U.S. and they chose you over your brother. Yes. So talk about how that decision impacted your your life and your career. Well, let's start from the beginning. I grew up in Morocco, uh, born in 1972, so I was 22 when I came to the U.S. in 1994. Um, I originally wanted, or my dad wanted me to be a doctor. And then the borders opened up with Russia, and there were so many people coming back from Russia with degrees in pharmacy or medical degrees. So it felt, and the other doctors were not retiring, uh, family doctors were not retiring. So it was a flood of doctors in Morocco. Some qualified, some not so qualified. But at the end of the day, he figured, and coming from a Muslim uh, country, that the patriarch will decide what you do and what school you go to and all of these things. And you have to listen to your dad. So he made me switch after two years uh, of pre-med to a business school. The whole purpose was to go to business school and then go to Italy. So I learned Italian. Uh, Morocco is bilingual, so we speak Arabic at home and French in school, because we were a colony of France. And then, Applied for a visa for Italy and got denied. We do not get a good rap in Italy as Moroccans. So I was denied a visa and decided just to pick a school in Rabat, the capital of Morocco, a management school, which is what my dad wanted me to do. All his decisions for me ended up being great, but nonetheless, they were his decisions, not mine. So we were picking a school in Morocco, uh, a private school for management, and we were driving by this school, and there was, you probably, you guys are too young to know what a Toyota Celica is. It's basically, it was a cool car in the 1990s. You look at it now, you probably won't give it two looks. But in the 1990s, it was a cool car. So we stopped at that school, and I'm like, oh, this guy seems successful. This it was the president of the school. And he went to Iona. So I ended up going to that school for a couple of years, for two years as a freshman and, and a, a sophomore. And then there was an exchange program. Iona was sending international kids to Morocco to study. And we figured, why not send Moroccan kids to the US? Our English was, obviously, I listed three languages that I speak, and none of them was English. So we had to go and take some classes and try to learn English a little bit. We were, I guess, we realized after the fact that we learned the wrong English, 
not the American English, so I'm coming here and I'm talking about a lift and trousers, and people are looking at me like I have two heads. So it was a tough adjustment, short story. <laughs> and I had to take classes that were only numbers classes. Those are universal, right? So there was no struggle taking a corporate finance class because I came in as a junior with very limited English uh, or very limited American. And took those classes, got the support from a lot of professors. They were very patient with me and would kind of take it slowly and speak slowly and explain things to me. And that ended up being great. And uh, took communication classes within Iona. And we had the International uh, Student Council. And I think her name was uh, Mrs. Vanderbosch, who was responsible for all the international students in Iona. And it was a great community. Like, we all struggled with the same thing. I obviously came here with uh, my dad's life savings, which were about, I think, $28,000 at the time. And that was just enough for one year for me to be here. And had to figure out what to do afterwards. Had to struggle a little bit. It was not easy. I didn't have anybody to lean on back here. And going back home as a failure was not. So I had to figure things out. I mean, McDonald's, I think, is still across the street here. <laughs> hey, they used to have a dollar Big Mac, and I would buy about, <laughs> sorry. They used to have a dollar Big Mac. I would buy 10, 20 of them, freeze them. I know they don't taste as good when you cook them afterwards. But you know what? I had to do what I had to do. I worked catering, did weddings, bus tables did everything that I could to make sure that I can afford the second year of college. Obviously, doing these jobs that I just listed, you're not going to be able to afford it. And I walked into uh, President Liguri at the time, who was the head here at Iona, and I just told him. I was actually running a 4.0 GPA for the first year. And he said, if you continue on doing that, we will waive the tuition fees. I can't get a scholarship as an I-20 student because I had to prove to get that visa that I actually could support myself. But obviously, I couldn't. So I could support myself for one year, but not after that. So they agreed to waive that and helped me a lot. And I was able to actually graduate with my bachelor's degree. And then I had another problem. The other problem is. Once you finish your school, you're supposed to go back home. I was not going back home. I was here. I was staying here. I was going to figure out a way. I was not going to be illegal, but I was going to figure out a way. And as long as you stay in school, your status is not burned. So I figured instead of doing what a lot of people do, which is go, to, go work and then come back and do your MBA, I figured I just might as well do my MBA straight. Again, Iona was very helpful. And there was no graduate assistantship, which basically would waive all your fees, your tuition fees, available in finance. So I took one in the telecommunication department in Murphy Center. I'm not sure if it's still called Murphy Center. So that helped me for one year. And then an opening with Dr. Shetty and Dr. Mangero opened up here, which I believe they're still here. They are still here. <laughs> so, so We all know some have them right now. Yeah, So, and Dr. Mangiro specifically was amazing to me. He took care of, he knows Dr. Mangiro? He like, yeah, he, he really took care of me. He helped me find jobs that wouldn't, because I'm not allowed to work outside of campus. So just so. for context, because I was the international counselor here, my prior role in admissions, and so international students are limited, right? And so they're coming here, they come here to study and not to work. And so yeah. to actually work outside of campus, you need to apply for a visa. And it's very difficult because there's only a certain amount of H-1B you know, work visas that's yes. allotted to. So. Yeah, and you're not allowed to have them if you have an F-1 visa as well. So it... They really took care of me. I worked security at Iona. I put on my security vest. I was probably 120 pounds soaking wet back then, gained a little weight. But I would walk basically everywhere here, clock in. And the head of security here, I forgot his name, an amazing guy. And his wife would actually take me home and teach me English and help me out. So I got help, in short, from everyone, whether it's the president or Dr. Mangero, 
or the security guy. So like a community. Uh, it was a community. I, I felt that I was in America, I was in New York, I was in New Rochelle, but I only really belonged in Iona. That's where I felt like I was actually allowed to be myself. Once I left campus, and I lived on Horton Avenue, and with five other Moroccans in a one bedroom, I think, no, sorry, it was a two bedroom. And we just kind of shared in our own misery once we leave here, because we're, the customs are different. You miss home during the holidays. I remember my first Thanksgiving coming out and looking at, everything is closed and I'm looking for food. I didn't realize that it was such a big deal. So I know now. <laughs> But back then, it was a little hard to. So faced a lot of challenges. One of them is obviously English. I talk too much now. But, yeah, but you others were over... money. Others were cultural. There were quite a few things. But there was a but lot of support. You seem to get by. <laughs> I try. So, um, so, so your Iona story, very great story. So talk, now moving on to your first job at, after Iona, right? Yeah. Um, you started at Nine West. I did. I only had two. I only interviewed in my life twice. And both of those interviews were in 1998 when I was leaving Iona, when I graduated. And one was, was with Solomon Brothers, and that required kind of having like Uncle Jimmy and Aunt this and Aunt that to help you with your sales and your commissions. And it was more low base salary, high commission but uncertainty. And the other one was with Nine West, Women's Shoes, and it basically involved handling Nine West and brand, another brand, Easy Spirit, which you're probably not moms, but your grandmothers would know the brand. It's for a certain age group, and handling it for Canada. And since I spoke French, it was a perfect fit for me, and it had a steady, nice little fixed salary, not much, but you know what? I figured I'd get my foot through the door. I was technically overqualified on paper because I'm taking an entry job and I have an MBA. So I had to keep that MBA off my resume. And that was the advice of career services that there's no need to put that on there at this time. And wait until you get your foot through the door. Otherwise, people won't hire you because they think you're overqualified and just using them as a stepping stone. So I ended up leaving it out and started at Nine West. And you were and there for 17 years? I was there for 17 years, yes. You started yes. as an uh, uh, um, accounts uh, production coordinator. Which is a glorified um, word for order entry. <laughs> I, people did the sales and I entered the orders. I, there was no real internet back then. So they would call, I would write it down then enter it in the system, and then it goes to folks that would handle the PL, well, or the purchase order. You must have been really good at your job because then you became CFO and senior vice president later I, on. I did. So I started in international, and I knew I wanted to be in finance. So I had to find my way into finance. The first thing was get your foot through the door, and then you prove yourself. I followed a different strategy than most people. I think a lot of people will feel entitled to be in finance. I actually didn't. I would clock out and then ask the finance folks if I could help with projects. So I'm now working, but I'm not getting paid. So I proved myself, and when there is an opportunity that opens up, I was hoping they would think of me. We had a mentorship program, and I picked a mentor in finance. And he was the director of international finance at the time at Nine West. He later became the CFO. But I picked him as a mentor, and that helped me a lot, getting his advice and also building some goodwill with, with him. So when draft day came and a position opened, they thought of me first and brought me into finance as a staff accountant. So it was amazing. They didn't give me any money. I'm following the same logic. I do not follow money. I follow a career. So I took the job, and it didn't matter whether it paid more or not. What mattered to me is as if you're driving and you're lost, and somebody just put you away, or Google Maps just put you in the right path. Mm -hmm. And I felt I was in the right path. So I took that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And from the right there thing, on, yeah, met the right people, and they um, exactly. confided in you. And 
Yeah, they gave and, you the opportunity. and then it's a mix of three things that would get you from that to being the CFO after 17 years. If they had asked me to sign a contract that year at $28,000 a year, I probably would have signed the contract for four years because me coming from Morocco, I multiply everything by 10 and 28,000 sounds like $280,000. And that's, I still do that today. I think of numbers a little bigger, but I think of it the same exact way. And I think the fact that I struggled financially when I was going to school here kind of helped me in my career today that value not penny pinching, but value um, money. yes, the value of money, it does not matter, it all adds up mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And so after Nine West, you went over to Sears Holding Corporation, right? And so, which is the parent company of Sears and Kmart stores. Yes, so when <laughs> I, I left Nine West after 17 years and I felt like I stayed too long, people were telling me I stayed too long, but I was not going to leave. I was going to probably retire from Nine West. I was in financial troubles, uh, was looking for what I'll call mercenaries, people with a lot of expertise and that would think differently than the typical Sears person. Sears and Kmart, same company. So um, when you said four, it's really three because they're the same company. And he said, do you want to come over to Chicago? And try to turn around, help us turn around the business. We're going to hire you in footwear. You'll be the CFO. We're going to hire somebody else in appliances. We're going to hire somebody else in home, somebody else in jewelry, so on and so forth. Um, I accepted because I wanted to see what life is outside of the branded footwear business. And I was still in footwear. I'm a footwear guy, and I'm always going to be a footwear guy. So, and that's where I think all my goodwill and reputation is built. So I went to Sears. I did not move to Chicago. I had probably one of the longest commutes anybody could wish for. So I would fly in on Monday, fly back on Wednesday. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. Fly back again on Thursday morning and fly back Every Friday. Every week you would do that? Every week I would do that. I would, like, and who was paying for your tickets? Uh, Sears is. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, so I would just commute. I didn't want to. I knew it was. Yeah, very expensive. <laughs> I, I did not want to move my family without the certainty of Sears being able to pull out of their financial troubles. And obviously, as you all know, they were not able to. So I was responsible for footwear. Um, footwear did well, but footwear, and I had a great team. Uh, footwear did so well, they offered me to take over home. So I took over home. And then they offered me jewelry, then fine jewelry. Mm -hmm. And not just a CFO now, I'm the CFO, I'm also the president. Mm -hmm. And so I did all of that, but all of that combined that I just mentioned is about 20% of Sears. Sears was getting killed by Best Buy, by Home Depot, by Lowe's, by Amazon mm -hmm. in the appliances world. And that was the majority of the business and that business could not be turned around. So they filed for bankruptcy. I actually left uh, before that, and I, when things started getting really bad, I called Steve Madden. Can I get that job you offered me? <laughs> no, no, no. I had told them uh, I would be back in two years. Uh -huh. So after that happened and things were not great, I learned a lot from Sears. I learned what to do. I also learned what not to do. It was so bureaucratic that if you needed to spend money on something, I had to come here, sit like this, and there would be people like judges that you have to make a case to. And that's just a waste of time. And Steve Madden is completely the opposite, like way opposite of bureaucracy. We're like a mom and pop shop, a two and a half billion dollar mom and pop shop. And we operate like a family. It's very different. There is no bureaucracy. So I called Ed and I said, you remember that two years that I told you? I know it's only been a year and maybe 10 months, but I'm ready. And he said, can you start Monday? I'm like, well, not Monday. But <laughs> Give me two weeks. Yeah, good. Let's, let me figure out a few things here. I had to figure out some non-competes and a few things that, so I don't end up getting sued by Sears. So things and worked out well. And I moved to back to New York. And 
And so <laughs> talking about you know going into Steve Madden, so you mentioned it's a two point one billion dollar company. Um, yeah. Can you share some two point one revenue, two point five market cap? Yes. There you go. Um, can you share some insights into your role at, um, as CFO? You know, maybe describe what a typical day looks like for you, and um, you know, how are you positioning the company for long-term success? Well, if I had a typical day, I would not be CFO. That's not. I'm not going in and doing my old job of order entry. The only thing typical in my day is my drive and to the office, where my office is located. And that's about it. Everything else will depend on what the day brings. I do have some day-to-day -day things that I like to do. And I do have some strategic things that I have to do. I compartmentalize everything in my head. Everything has a different compartment. And, but I tackle what I can tackle that day. I do not do, and maybe your professors won't like that I'll say this, I, I do not believe in to-do lists. To me, a to-do list is in itself should be part of my to-do list. I'll just write, do, create a to-do list, and I'll stop there. <laughs> but I believe in just do what's important, break down the problem, and tackle it in pieces. It's like, a, I don't know, it's like Greenberry type of approach. It's never tackle a problem in its entirety. Always break it down into pieces, and they're a lot easier to solve that way than that's trying to solve the problems of the world. So what's next for Steve Madden? I mean, what's, you know, in terms of expansion, I was actually just in um, DC over the weekend, and I saw that you're opening a location there. Um, and in, in terms of products or you know, you know, territories, you know, what's next for the company? I can't give you the spoilers <laughs> now. No, so the, the big headlines for us right now is, so we have a very strong US business. 80% uh, of our business in, is in the US. The other 20% is across 76 plus, maybe 80 countries. So Grow International is very important to us. We're still underpenetrated in the international markets. So we want to do that. Um, we're we have connections in Morocco. We do. We do have connections in Morocco. I know a few people there. <laughs> so we actually just opened three stores in Morocco. Oh, nice. Yeah, I opened them last year. But Grow Europe. South Africa is doing amazing. Uh, Mexico is doing great. We, we have a different approach to international business. We first de-risk the market. So we find a distributor with knowledge of the market, and we let them distribute our product under uh, a licensing agreement. And once we feel that the market, that we know a lot about the market, then we go into a joint venture with that distributor, where we own typically 51%, so we're majority owners and we can control all the decisions. And once we feel that the joint venture has reached its maturity level, then we go into full ownership. So we fully own Mexico, Canada, and Europe. And we're in joint ventures in China, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, please get Southeast Asia, uh, Israel, uh, South Africa, and I'm missing one. How many stores do you have? Globally, if you include the ones we operate directly and the one operated by our distributors, uh, just about 500. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's one thing, growing international. The other thing that we want to do is grow our direct-to-consumer business overall, even in the U.S. So anything DTC, because we have a high penetration. You walk into Nordstrom, you'll see our shoes everywhere because we have a high penetration in wholesale. We also, most people don't know, and sometimes I get a text from someone and saying, Walmart copied your shoe. I'm like, well, we made it. We, we make pretty much all the shoes at Walmart and Target that under their own brand names, but they're all inspired by, call it, maybe two months ago, we had them out under the Steve Madden brand or under Dolce Vita or under Anne Klein. These are all brands that we own or license. We are licensed Anne Klein, we own Dolce Vita. And so we have a big penetration in wholesale. So growing DTC is very important to us. The other area that we're focused on is beyond footwear. Accessories, apparel, so those are things that we're focused on, and we acquired a company called BB Dakota, a apparel company in 2019, and that gave us kind of permission to play in the apparel business. Mm -hmm. So those are basically our main 
uh, strategies outside of growing our organic business of footwear. And we're trying to do that all under the umbrella of sustainability and social responsibility. Steve is a big believer in doing well, but doing good at the same time. And you can't do one without the other. So talking about Steve, everyone knows him, right? The shoes, uh, either from the shoes or from the movie The Wolf of Wall Street, right? And so, um, you know, but there are aspects of his life that many people may not know. Um, he, he faced drug addiction. He suffered from ADHD. You know, he committed financial crimes that landed him in jail. Yeah, right? that's and, in The Wolf of Wall Street, yeah, if anybody so, wants to watch it. Um, but he's also celebrated with revolutionizing the shoe industry. Yeah. Um, you know, he transformed a startup with only $1,000 into a multi-billion dollar business. Um, you know, what's it like working directly with Steve Madden, and how has his entrepreneurial vision um, influenced the, the trajectory of the company? Well, S S Steve is a, is a beast. He's, he's like he's a different person, like everything you said about him. Uh, he's not that shy guy that you see on the Wolf of Wall Street. Maybe he was back then. I didn't know him back then, thank God. But uh, I know him now, and he's just a big presence. His, everything that happened with uh, the Wolf of Wall Street story, and uh, I know he said Steve going to jail. We say when he went away, uh, when Steve was away. Uh, all of that made it that he can't be involved in the financial aspects of the company or hold the like financial roles or executive roles. So that made him even more powerful because now all his time is 100% creative. So all he does is shoes. It's design, it's surrounding with him, himself with a very talented design team. Not every shoe that we do was designed by Steve. So we do a combination of all. And he's 100% focused on creative. Mm -hmm. His strong beliefs, if like walking into his office, the first thing you'll see is a perfect decision made late is a bad decision. And what basically he's telling you is, you can't wait until you have every single piece of data before you make a decision. And everything is an evolution, not a revolution. So there, he's full of these things that he says that it's just amazing to work along him and work with he him also, on these things. You know, I read the book that you gave Lynn, yeah. his life story, his biography, and um, you know, I was very interested to, to learn how you know, um, involved he is with like the retail locations, right? He talked about how he still goes to retail locations and if there's a shoe out of place or if there's a light bulb or light that's out, he will make sure that, you know, presentation is everything to him. Yes. You know, and so yeah. talk about that. Well, that I'm pretty sure if you were here and looked at some of the shoes right there. Uh, yeah, so if it's not ours, mm -hmm. he would buy it from you. Yeah. He'll give like how much do you want for it because he loves it and he wants to take it for inspiration like he'll he's just so he's all he does we would be walking down manhattan and he's looking at ladies shoes yeah. so it's that's him his he wants it, his name is on top of the door it's not like he works for a company and that's it I and mean, he that's his name so he wants everything to be perfect so He's not going to call me ju just about the $10 million expense. or but He'll call me about a light bulb, as you said. And it's like, did you know this? I'm like, how would I, how would I know that? <laughs> so, but he's, he's very, he, he, he's a great guy. Um, so going back to your role, you know, um, you know, leadership, I'm sure, is a critical aspect of your role as CFO. Um, so describe you know, your leadership style um, and the key principles that guide your approach to you know, leading your own team. Well, yeah, given how my career evolved, I pretty much did every job that most of my teams do. At, when I say most, uh, I'm talking about the finance side. So I believe in treating people well. I believe that you should be respected, not feared. Fear is not a good thing. A leader should never be feared. They should be respected. I believe that my door should never be closed. Sometimes it's closed, but it does say, just knock and come in. Because it's, I'm in a meeting or it's a little loud outside, I'll close my door, but it's usually open. 
as a company, including me, we do not believe in executives. So I will never, ever call anybody into my office. If I need something, I'm going to walk over to their office or cube, sit with them there, and have a discussion about it. If it's not an HR matter, then it will be different. But if it's a business matter, I'm always traveling. It's good for my steps, yeah, right. and it makes you visible, mm -hmm. and it's a great thing. If my team is busy, and it shocks people, and I did it just yesterday, uh, if my team members are busy, and I'm out and I grab food, I'm food delivery guy now. Mm -hmm. I'm bringing food with me, whether they ordered it or not. I'll ask them and say, no, nah, that's OK, thank you. I'll bring food. I don't go to fancy places at lunch. I go to Chipotle. I have my places that I go to, Chick-fil-A, Chipotle. <laughs> so those are the places I go to. So I believe in past the dollar menu. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, leading by example is very important. If my team comes in, if we have a quarter close and, or Wall Street that we have our earnings release and they have to work a holiday or the weekend, oh, I'm there. Even if I can't really help them because I'll just get in the way if they're preparing something, I'm there should they need something. So my wife will say, why are you going to the office on a Sunday? Well, my team is there. So I will go there as well. Well, I noticed that there's a lot of uh, juniors and seniors in the room here tonight. And um, many of our seniors will actually be graduating in only seven months. Um, and so I know now it's like shock, right? Um, so I'd like to now talk about. How many people in finance here? Accounting? Is that OK? Marketing? Design? We don't do design here, right? Not in the business Same majors, but um, so yeah. So I like to just you know talk about you know things that that you think that the students should be thinking about as they get ready to prepare for for life after Iona. So one of the things that we emphasize here in the Lapenta School of Business is connections. All right, um, you men you mentioned earlier how mentorship is important. So, but to elaborate on that, you know, talk about the importance of building a network and mentorship. Do you have a mentor right now? Um, you know, and what do you advi What advice do you have for students? looking to build a professional network? Yeah, mentorship is very important. Uh, I have many employees that fall under the mentorship program through me. I have non-employees that I talk to. I have folks that, whether they went to Iona or not, if they reach out through LinkedIn, I try to always respond to everybody that reaches, reaches out to me. And some of them are international students, some folks that came and want to know basically what you guys know now, the struggles that I went through, how I overcame them, and so, and what to do, and what we're looking for. So mentorship is very important. But as far as students are graduating and with no experience, I think internships, because it's hard for us as hiring managers to look at your resume and say, this person has the experience I want. All you have is school and internships, and yourself when you show up for an interview. So personality is important, because you don't have anything to really say, I worked at Ralph Lauren, and I can bring this, these skills, and they're transferable. You don't have those things. All you have is, and we don't look at GPA, but if you come in with a 2.5, no, we're probably not looking at it. But if you come in with a decent GPA, I'm not going to say, oh, the 4.0 guy is better than the 3.5 guy. Um, that's really Surprise, not. grades matter, actually. <laughs> they, they do. They do. Because we, we do look at them, and we look at them from the aspect that you dedicated yourself to the work that you did at Iona or at whichever school you went to. And we never look. If anything, it actually works against someone. If I get a resume for somebody from Harvard, I'm like, eh, maybe not. Uh, Stepping Stone maybe just wants his first job, and in two years will ask me for a hundred thousand dollar raise. So that usually I don't. I do have people from uh, Ivy League that work for me. None of our executive team is from Ivy League. We just hire them to work for us and do uh, some of the analytics. They're well trained on those matters. But if 
if you bring a good personality, if you bring some relevant internships, and you engage and you're not just sitting there expecting the person interviewing you to ask you questions and you just answer, if you're involved, then that says a lot about how you're going to kind of assimilate to the culture. Um, I do want to just leave the last 15 minutes to questions, but before we move it on to questions, I just wanted to finally ask, you know, any last, you know, parting words of wisdom or advice or anything that you'd like to share that you didn't, that you think is important for the students to know? I think, and trust me on this, and I said it earlier, is do not follow the money. Follow the career path. Pick what you want to do and go for it. Something else could be look more lucrative and you could make $10,000 more versus let's say somebody's offering 50 and some other job is offering you 60, but it's in the wrong career path, just skip it. Stick with the career path. Never ask for, when once you get the job, never ask for money, that will come. Just do the work and the money will come. None of us managers, executives are blind. We know who's doing an amazing job, and we're going to take care of them. The sense of entitlement that I've been here for two years and I deserve a 20% raise, that doesn't sit well with anyone. But if you just forget about the money, put the money to the side, coming from a guy that struggled with money immensely, career is the most important thing for you. Don't settle for something outside of what you want to do. And I'm, this is very, like you hear a lot, do something that you love and you'll never work a day in your life. I didn't come up with it, but it is real. I love finance. I don't like Wall Street type finance, but I am a CFO of public company, so I do Wall Street type, but I don't wanna be on the other side as an analyst. I want to be in the cool finance, dealing with, fashion and going to trade shows, going to fashion shows, that type of finance is what I want to do. And that's the type of finance that I'm able to do at Steve Madden. So let's turn over to some questions. Um, so if you'd like to ask a question, um, please raise your hand. And then um, just, uh, if you're called, just stand up, um, say your name and major, and then Olivia will hand you uh, the mic and just make sure you project your voice. So what question, they might have a question for, if you have one for Kyle, too, feel free. <laughs> I'm the one here doing the interviews. <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. So my question is, when you were doing order entry, uh, did you know that you had such high aspirations to be CFO of that company? And if you did, how did you attack your day-to-day -day doing uh, boring work like that, but position yourself in the future to obviously rise to that position? Yeah, so thanks, great question. When I was doing order entry, no. I didn't think that I would get where I am. When I was doing order entry, I was, let's call it in survival mode. I just needed to get my foot in and then figure things out once I know what I can and cannot do. Different for you than for me as an international, I always doubted myself originally that maybe I'll wake up one day and that GPA is not real. Like I didn't believe that all of these things were possible. That's why I said earlier, if they had asked me to sign a contract for life at that salary, I probably would have signed it. So I didn't know that at the time, but as soon as I realized and you start getting the praise of your managers and the CFO warned me in the board meetings to take notes, I'm like, I'm getting a lot of access here. Maybe I should have that growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And the growth mindset tells you basically set goals, but don't keep them fixed. You have to change them. So I, now I said, I want to be a manager by this year. I want to be a director by this year. I want to be a VP by this other year. And I keep adjusting those because I think I had VP after 20 years and I was CFO after 17. So it's, you just keep adjusting it and going after it. Because now you believe in yourself. You don't need someone to tell you that. And you're just going after it. You still have to prove it to them because they have to elevate you. But 
now you have that belief and that growth mindset, and that's very important in a career. Don't set a goal and just stick to it. It's like you're going on a highway and you have traffic and some people will just sit on it and wait until it clears. I'm the guy that's like, let me get out of the highway and find another way. And so th it was an adjustment that I had to make. Cooper? First off, thanks for coming. Um, I'm Cooper Hasley. I'm a finance major here, um, senior. But my question to you is, through your time after Iona and through Sears, and it kind of sees potential in you and kind of the right spot for you. I, I yeah, I, I was good at numbers. I built a good reputation. Yes. <laughs> I built a good reputation for myself in the industry. I did not, I was not just a bean counter. So I was not just about numbers. I was about operations. I was about, I expanded my knowledge post what I learned here. And the thing that we didn't mention, because I obviously, I, it's all my fault, I didn't mention it to you, is I'm the CFO, but I'm also uh, over IT, over cybersecurity, over operations, over a lot of things that I did not have an education that says I should be over those things. But as you grow and you expand your knowledge, then you're more of an attractive asset to companies. Uh, yes, thank you for coming. I'm Matthew Minuelli. I'm a senior Matthew. and a finance major. Um, what is the biggest obstacle that you went through in your life at working at Sears or Steve Madden? And what were the proper steps that you took to get you through that process? At, well, at, at Nine West, to me, originally the biggest obstacle always was always language because I picked a job that I supported Canada and I supported Quebec, the French part of Canada. So I even made it even harder for myself because, well, the job was easier, but I was not learning. It didn't matter how many MTV, how much MTV I watched and put the closed caption in. I learned a lot from closed, closed captioning. So that is obviously a struggle and I had to get over the language part. Um, the biggest struggle at Nine West was when we went from being public to being private and it was tough to handle those things. So I had to do the right thing, believe in that I, as I said earlier, that I should be fair to all the employees and not do things just for the company at the expense of the employees because the employees are the biggest asset of the company. So I made a different decision to exit that situation. At Sears, as I said, you learn what to do and what not to do. The one thing that helped me at Steve Madden working for Sears and going through the bankruptcy is when I was now at Steve Madden working with CEOs and CFOs from department stores that were in trouble. So now I know how to talk to them without insulting them. So I learned by being on the other side and somebody saying, oh, we can't ship you Sears because you're not going to pay us and you're going to go bankrupt. That hurt when you're on that side. But when I was when now at Steve Madden, when talking, and there were a lot of post-COVID, and even during COVID or pre-COVID, there were a lot of bankruptcies that happened in the US in department stores. So I knew how to talk to them. I knew what to say without insulting them to keep the business going. Should they come out of their trouble, I need them as a customer. So I had to maintain that relationship, and I learned that from the difficult times that we had to go through at Sears. Thank you. She's taking the long yeah. way. Yeah. She'll She'll actually, yeah, <laughs> she was being respectful of the camera. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Olivia. Thank you. My name is Justin Bainbridge. I'm a business administration major. Um, something I was wondering is, what is the most inspiring part about Steve Madden's work ethic, and like, what makes him stand out in front of like everyone else to be the best? Uh, Steve himself, or Steve Madden the company? Uh, Steve, Steve himself? himself, yeah. Uh, 
it's just his dedication. It's his passion that he has for the brand or his name. So he's just a different, as I called him a beast earlier, he's all over. He wants to know about everything. Nothing is too big or too small. And the dangerous thing sometimes with executives is when they look at things as too small and forget that small adds up. He doesn't look at any, sometimes he'll look at his team's expense report and will call me, same as with the light bulb, and ask me, did you know that this person spent this much on this dinner? I'm like, no, because I don't look at their credit cards while during the month, I look at the statement or somebody in my team will look at it. But he's so involved, so passionate, and it just, everybody believes in the Steve mentality. And if you're not on board with that passion, and you're not on board with speed, which we are the fastest company to deliver a shoe from design to floor. If you don't believe in that, then you're not fit to be at Steve Madden. And if you believe in being an executive in an ivory tower, which none of us have an ivory tower in our building, we still are in the building where the company started. So we acquired companies that have beautiful buildings, but not corporate office. We have the, I'll leave the word blank, office of all of them. I'm sure you can guess what word it is, but that's where we are. We tried to move once, but Steve is very, very spiritual, and we even have a guru that comes from India and blesses the building and does a few things. Steve is Jewish, but we do have a guru that comes from India and blesses the building and everything else, and it's tradition that we do. And it will bless people, and it will sit with you, help you with breathing, do yo we do yoga, we do a lot of things at Steve Madden, and that's all Steve, and that's how he rules, and that's how he runs everything. It's very different than your typical company, and that's one of his biggest qualities. Awesome, maybe thank maybe you. Maybe I'll leave here and go there to work. You, sh you should. <laughs> or maybe you can have both. I, I, I did more than one job many times in my career. Um, we have uh, one, time for one more question. My name is Oluwa Walemiwa Olusanya, or Wally for sure. I'm an accountant junior, and um, my question was, I know you touched base on having an important team or a strong team. What are some key factors you look at individuals to building a strong team? Uh, for them to be smarter than me. So I always believed through my career that to be promotable, you have to be replaceable. If you're not replaceable, you'll keep doing that same job that you've always done because your manager can't live without you. But if you train someone below you that is smart, then that basically that will be your replacement. If you're insecure, you'll start thinking maybe I'll lose my job to that guy. But if you're secure in your abilities, then you'll be able to grow, and that person grows as well. But what do I look for? I, I don't look for Harvard on a resume. I look for personality. I look for loyalty. I look for people that will be committed. And it shows in an interview if someone thinks that if I'm going to basically end up with someone that will feel entitled to every single thing before they even start the job. So I'm looking for people that are willing to put in the effort. I'm looking for people that don't want to just specialize in one thing because I would like to be able to grow them and give them more knowledge and have them have a clear career path versus just a steady eddy that will just do that same job. Everybody has a degree. It's hard to assess people from a degree. It's hard to assess people from a resume as well, because it's not, not everything on a resume can be validated. So ultimately, you assume those things being right, but the decision-making process becomes to the delivery of the person that comes with that resume and how strong of a show. Are there they specific have. things you look for in terms of involvement or prior work experience? Internships? Well, yeah, you want skills. You want internships. Uh, that are, I look at them only if they're relevant to our industry. Uh, involvement, yes, you want to see people that do other things than just study. 
You want to see that they're helping or tutoring other kids. You want to see that they're involved in other activities within the university. So you want to see all of those things because that tells you that that person will be a team member, not just an employee, that they'll work with everybody. Well, I think that should be music to some of the students' ears because I've been going around to all the, the classes and, and giving pitches on that. So um, that's all the time we have for today. This was so fun. Yeah, it's cool. Everyone give Zine a round of applause. Thank you.